Okay, we're going to get through this. Uh, I'm ready to get here on Friday. I'm sure you guys are as well. So I'll try not to uh, pontificate too much. I'll just be straight to the point and get through this. Uh, the skeleton for the final report uh, in the schedule for the project, you see that's set to Monday. So I didn't list that as homework. It'll be optional. If you want to turn that in with your group, if you want, if you want your project management group to turn that in, feel free. Uh, if you don't feel like doing it and you feel like you have plenty of good direction on your own, that's fine too. Uh, if you turn them in, I'll gladly look through them and mark up what you're doing wrong and what you might need to, what you might be missing. Uh, went over in class how to take nice, pretty pictures of things in SolidWorks. I want to show you what I mean by that. The tool that's best to take a screenshot in Windows, in my opinion, and a lot of people know about the print screen button where you just mash the button, copy paste, or just paste that into a graphics editing program, save it, drop it, do whatever you want. Uh, that's several steps involved with that. So if we just uh, go down here and open up what's called the snipping tool, a little piece of software they started including in Windows where it just lets you immediately crop out a portion of the, uh, the picture. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, the settings are already back to what it should be, but I think uh, three-point faded is the default. If I take a snip of the screen under that, if I see it anymore. You see that the uh, edges are kind of dark and brown. This is what I was talking about when you're doing reports, that uh, the background won't go away. Even if you try to use transparent color, unless you go through the trouble of using uh, Microsoft PowerPoint's uh, background removing tool, which is kind of flaky in my opinion, uh, the, the background will always be there. A uh, the better way to do that, you saw me change this button right here, change it to plain white background. This will allow you to take pictures of your bridge, of your parts, of whatever you're doing SolidWorks work on forever with a plain white background. That way you just select it as a transparent color. You turn off shadows as well, of course. Uh, the background will completely disappear and you put this straight to your project report uh, very nicely. It, it won't show up with these strange borders. Uh, so that's a formatting thing. If you show up with a bunch of really bad, really badly cropped pictures or really badly inserted things, or poorly inserted, uh, you'll probably dock a couple points. So that are the kind of the two public service announcements we have. Look, take a look at the homework for this week. Uh, yeah, basically three tasks. The fourth is just how to turn things in. Uh, first of which is use smart fasteners to seal the pressure cylinder with appropriately sized socket head cap screws. Uh, assume the holes are threaded. Uh, the second task will be run the half wing spar test case. We're getting into smart components and FDA this week. The first exercise I have to do with the smart ones. FDA will be exercises two and three. Uh, use FDA to uh, Guide your geometric changes to the parts. So you don't change the material, you don't change the loads, you just change the geometry to make that part not fail. Uh, we'll go into some detail on that whenever we open it up. Uh, finally, in the third one, we set up and run the simple test bridge load case, which is this bottom one. I was going to do a nice little suspension bridge thing here. I thought this was quite simple, but uh, it ended up being a little bit too complicated for what I think you guys should run your first time with FDA. Uh, you have to do some very unique things to make that simulate uh, properly. Basically, just keep the cables under tension. It would take some work. Uh, so I didn't, uh, I didn't choose for you to do this your first time here. So we'll do the simpler bridge case. This is like three or four hours of work. I just got to get away. So it took a while last weekend. Run the simple bridge case with fixed ends. It gives you the same loading you have in your project. You have to have gravitational acceleration on. Otherwise, you're not paying for the weight of the material that's cantilevered out over the water or supported elsewhere. You have to have aluminum 2014 alloy for the walkway. We would like to use wood, but I'll go over the reason why you can't do that. And specify the steel you use for the truss setup. And again, at the end, once you run it through FBA, use that snipping tool I just showed you. You can just access that by typing a snip here, or you can find it under accessories uh, to take a nice screenshot. Finally, you turn in the uh, completed spherical pressure vessel, which you'll see here in a second, a modified wing spar, and a screenshot of its valve loading case. And finally, a screenshot of the sample bridge under load showing you got it configured properly. I'll give you some sample pictures here to help you out, just showing how things should go, as well as a link to some uh, a Wikipedia page on yielding mechanics, like how uh, what makes materials fail, how they perform when they get to their limiting cases, limiting loads, and uh, some other some other situations. Just basically, this whole second page is just a little bit of help for you guys as you go through the exercises. So anyway. Get back to the primary thing here. This is a part that SolidWorks has gone nice and nice and screwed up for me, so let me try to reopen it and see if it'll do it again. Anyway, I'll just show you the picture here. The bolt part up here is what I created to try to make the most annoying 
homework problem for you, period. If you didn't know the stuff we're going to teach you this week. If you had to make those covers for the, sil uh, for the sphere, and then design a bolt to fit each, each hole, and put it in manually, and do all these mates, and do everything constrained properly, that would be terrible. And we'd all hate ourselves, and everybody would hate me, and it just wouldn't be good. Thankfully, SolidWorks has a tool called uh, Smart Components. There's two different imp implementations I'll show you today. There's actually three in real life. I'll comment on the third, but as I was trying to incorporate it into this lecture, uh, it got really, really buggy. So I decided maybe it's not kind of ready for me. So anyway, we'll just go uh, straight into it. Create a new assembly. I'll bring in the Sphere Center, which of course these are available on OC to OK State, these component parts, as they usually are. I'll bring in one of the lids. All right, so I'll simply make this to that using the primitive. I'll make sure that these holes are lined up properly. Okay. Now I can do the same thing, hold down control, copy it over like you've done a lot. I don't want to use pattern yet. I'll make this guy here. Okay. And make sure the holes line up concentric justly. Okay, so these should no longer rotate. Fixed. Okay, that's fixed. Good to go. I'll go ahead and use we what are a couple different ways that I can propagate those lids the rest of the way around without having to just control copy them? Copy with mates. Copy or copy with mates, yeah, that's definitely one. And then another would be how would I copy a component perhaps in a circular manner? Uh, circular manner. Yeah. Um I'll do, I'll do them with both. Let's see, let's start with the circular pattern. I'll uh, we'll use this component. I want to turn on temporary axis so I can see the axis that's going up there implicitly through that top part. So I can spin that component around it. I want four of them, which are equally spaced. Looks great. Okay, so now I've copied that. These can't spin because they're constrained in the same sense as this one is. And finally, uh, secondly, I'll just go ahead and uh, do a copy with mates on this guy. Um, so that main component would be this line down here. There we go. And then this one. Gosh, which which hole is that? Is it one of the corner ones? Uh, them? Maybe? Yeah. It's upside down, so I can flip the first guy. There we go. Alright, so that should work. So which whichever one's easier is kind of up to you, but they're both probably quicker than you know, insert, browse, find, click, drag, whatever. So things like this are what's are going to save you a lot of time on your final. Uh, knowing not just how to get things done in a way, but knowing multiple ways to get things done in SolidWorks so you can choose the fastest. Is usually the usually the reason that some people do roll on tests and some people don't. Okay, so we have the basic form here. You have a bridge part. You made all these different plates. You made I beams. You poke holes in all the adjoining plates and all the I beams, and now you're sitting. They're staring at all these things, not wanting to actually have to model bolts, drag and drop them in. So that just sounds really boring, and it would be. Uh, SolidWorks has a library built in, a, a, a toolbox, if you will. Uh, it is, sometimes they'll ask you if you want to add it in, and just say yes. So underneath toolbox, we have different, you know, country standards. We're ANSI inch. Then inside of this, you have bearings, bolts and screws, T-ways, bushings, nuts, O-rings, pins, power transmission, like gears, pulleys. Uh, retaining rings, structural members, and washers. Basically stuff you'd get from a master car, from SP, SPI, 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 stock drive products uh, to the company. Or some of these other, you know, parts supply warehouses. Lowe's, maybe, you know, they don't have that much for engineering. But just under bolts and screws, there's an entire extra subset of types of bolts and types of screws. You can imagine there's a ton. It has washers, it has uh, bolts, nuts, everything. In this case, we're going to go down and use... Um, Socket head cap screws. That's what it calls for in the uh, exercise. You can see, I think some of these holes are quarter twenty, which means they're quarter inch diameter with twenty threads per inch. I want to find that bolt, but there's nothing. Oh, oh, come back. There's nothing over here listed that says quarter twenty. The reason it is that way is because you just drag and drop into the hole. You let me zoom in. Nothing can be simple today. and drop it, and it will snap to it. 
So it automatically detects the diameter of the hole it's trying to go into. It automatically detects where the bolt head should be. And you see over here you have a few final options. The two common types of quarter inch bolts are quarter 20 or quarter 28. That's just to get a difference in th uh, threads per inch. So do quarter 20, you choose the length of the overall bolt, which I'll make an inch long, sure. Uh, you choose the drive type, whether it's hex or spline or something else. I'm temporarily going to hide these uh, patterns on the side so you can see in and look at the bolt. It's a bit too long right now. So I can going to extend it just for a moment, two inches, to show you a few other options. Uh, somebody asked me about threads earlier this semester. And this is where you can change from a simplified display of threads, which is really just a cylinder, uh, to cosmetic. Cosmetic display is just a texture uh, that it applies, so this is still fairly computationally lightweight. Or you can finally go down to schematic representation, which actually shows in 3D, uh, you know, quarter 20 threads. If you change it to quarter 28, you see the density increases. It's an act, the actual model of the thread uh, standard. So I think this is really quite legit. It's a, it's a good way to put all these bolts in. But still, if I left you with only this knowledge, that would take forever to do, right? You have to drag and drop like 100 of these stupid things. So we're just going to close out of that. So that's how you do it. If you need to drag and drop in a bearing, remember to go to the toolbox, click on bearings, let's see if there's anything one small to fit in here. Um, let's do instrument ball bearing. Can we fit it there? Uh, maybe not. I haven't tried this. Probably a bit small. Okay. Anyway, if you have a, what is the smallest bearing to have in here? 0.025? Oh, it's 0.1 outer. Yeah. messed up at the moment, but you can drag and drop bearings into like a sleeve. Say you're working on the Baja car and you have a gearbox case, you want to support all the gear train with bearings on each sleeve, just cut a hole into it, drag and drop one of those bearings in. You can choose again what kind of representation that has. The simplest form of bearing model is basically just a few cylinders. You can take it all the way up to the fully detailed uh, ball bearing model that has every individual ball bearing in there, the races. It'll get quite uh, detailed if you want. So just keep in mind this whole toolbox is over here. Uh, thrust bearings, ball bearings, what else do they have in this thing? Uh, basically all the stuff that you would probably find too annoying to have to model on yourself, on your own. Anyway, so back to the, back to the regular scheduled programming. We get back to uh, showing all these components. The way you take care of all of these at once doesn't work on this computer. Tuesday worked fine in physical science in 110. Came here to teach class Wednesday, clicked the button, same process, same everything, didn't work. So we'll see today if we're lucky enough that it just decides to work again. But I've checked and it has worked for every student up in their labs. So this computer just has something weird with it, or perhaps I just screwed up. But what you do is go to Smart Fastening. And this, uh, this is just Windows telling you it might take some extra time. Smart Fastening isn't an instantaneous thing. But what you should be able to do, if SolidWorks works without bugs and perfect, which it's not. Uh, you should be able to go in here and just click Populate All. And what SolidWorks will do is look for any two assembly parts that have matching uh, matching holes that line up. And say, oh, you probably want to put, put a bolt in that. It finds an appropriate bolt, fills in the hole, and populates it all. But that, of course, doesn't really work that well. On a computer where this is actually working, um, you can just click that button and it works just fine. My installation at home, you click Populate and it'll at least do one of these plates. It doesn't completely work perfectly, but um, what you can do is go through and click each surface individually. And this means that SolidWorks is going to look at each one of those surfaces, find any holes that are in there, and try to populate them with a bolt. So we just click Add, SolidWorks starts thinking, and if it's like Wednesday, this is going to fail, but in your labs it's going to work. This is what I mean by it's going to take a while, because it's having to do all, all the logic of every one of these holes, deciding which kind of bolts can put in. Yeah, so you absolutely failed here. Uh, I had no idea why this computer does not work and the rest of them do. I just I just don't know. But uh, when you click that, populate in your computers upstairs, a, the appropriate size bolt pops in every single hole. Uh, it'll occasionally miss one or two, but you can then populate yourself by dragging and dropping. Let me go back to show you. You had 
had a one screw was already populated there, and you wanted to fill up the hole next to it, just hold down control. Once that configure is done. Something with the smart components on this installation is just completely messed up. It works fine in your lab. So you'll be able to hold down control, click and drag it, just like you would with the normal assembly part. It will again snap intelligently to the next uh, to the next hole. So something very, very useful. If you're working on your bridge and you put those plates to connect all your I-beams together, that you don't want to sit there and drag and drop bolts one by one. Click smart fasteners. And they all get populated. You can have what's called a top stack and bottom stack on these components. Like say you wanted to get an extremely large bolt. You would have a bolt head, washer, lock, or bolt head, lock nut, washer, and then the part. Then on the bottom, you wanted to have the part, washer, lock nut, and then a final tightening nut. Uh, you can do that from top and bottom stack. So every instance, every hole that's matching up, you'll put the same washers, components on either side uh, all the way through. So that's a really, really fast and quick way to add some detail to your models. I was working on, I tell, I tell this anecdote every week, or every uh, lecture this week. I was working on the selection team for uh, camera payload for UAVs. There, we had two competing cameras that were going to be carried in a small UAV. Uh, both of them turned in pretty good models. One of them was really, really detailed, and we kind of were very, very surprised. They went down and modeled every individual bolt, every nut, every everything. You can see the threads on the bolts. And so, you know, me being an intern, I was like, how in the world? You know, these guys are completely have way too much time. This is nuts. Why did they spend the time doing that? Now I realize they just went to SolveWorks and clicked the, uh, you know, clicked the smart password button. And they basically won the contract because of that. For several million dollars. They were selected over another company because their CAD model was super impressive. So it, that last little, the last little polishing features are sometimes the thing that really puts you over the edge on a proposal. That's what sends the person the, uh, gives, them the gives them the impression that you're extremely skilled, you're very diligent, and you're going to turn, turn in some good work. So keep that in mind when you're doing your bridge project. Uh, anyway, any questions on smart fasteners? Sorry I can't show it to you right now, but it does work in your lab. Anybody? All right. FEA. I always start this with a disclaimer because I'm going to show you how to do FEA in SolidWorks. It's becoming more and more accessible, and it's something that I think is really, really cool. Uh, smart fasteners are basically the last thing we're going to teach you this semester as far as core functionality goes. Uh, from this point forward, we're going to be discussing add-ins. Uh, add-in features to SolidWorks that really lets you use your solid models to do something useful with them. CFD is an add-in. Motion, motion and physics simulation is an add-in. FEA is an add-in. You can simulate thermal stresses, uh, physical dynamic stresses, all sorts of things in SolidWorks. It's actually really, really capable. That being said, FEA is, uh, without proper training, you can get false results quite easily and never even know it. Uh, the solver will say, hey, look, it solved, it worked, the, the, uh, the equations are balanced, but they might not really be. Uh, FEA is something you need to have some training in, you need to work with some experts to know how to converge solutions, how to do grid uh, density studies. Uh, you need to have some more experience later on in school uh, to know the math that actually underlies FEA. I'm only saying this because I don't want you to go out and you know design yourself a new paintball 8,000 PSI pressure tank that you're going to have next to your face and then it blows up and you've got like, something in your neck. Because SolidWorks said it would work. Um, it's capable, it's cool, but just know that it can be misleading if you use them properly. So don't consider yourself professionals in it. Just I hope that it excites some of you to really follow a uh, maybe a material science and design, you know, material design type uh, path. It's a really cool deal. Plus, you'll be able to use it on projects, proposals, the rest of your school because uh, you basically just click this the FEA button and it works, and it'll really impress your professor. Okay, anyway, enough of that talking. Let's go to file, open. I've prepared a simple demo, first of all, full test material sample. Does anybody recognize that? What is it from? Is it like the FDA house, like the tensile stress machine? Yeah, tensile stress machine. Why? Who would use this and why? I mean, you had to raise your hand. Oh, I've recognized it from the strength of materials. Oh, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll pull samples like this in strength of materials. Uh, but really, uh, Outside of academics, they use this whenever they pour a new batch of metal. 
Like whenever you go and order some aluminum uh, 7075 T6 timber, metal, how do you know that they actually ship you the right thing? Well, normally they include a test sheet which tells you that in this batch that we poured, we pulled so many test samples and statistically it had this average yield strength, this average uh, ultimate strength, blah, 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 modulus, and all the other material properties they can measure in simple tests like this. I think they also sometimes do a hardness test on it. They basically send you a spec sheet with that specific pour so that you know they didn't actually mess something up. They didn't actually you know, like spit in the aluminum too much to make it all wrong. They didn't mess up the chemical composition of it, and it's going to be able to hold your wing on your airplane. So anyway, this is a simple test. We're going to go into FBA. The first thing you have to do is go to Tools, Add-ins, uh, turn on SolidWorks Simulation. That's just uh, that's enabling the extra add-in toolbox. In fact, all these extra add-ins that are in the list are things that if you were in industry, you'd have to pay a few thousand dollars more a year to use. Um, since we get the student version, we kind of get most of them for free, which is nice. Uh, scan 3D. We talked about 3D cameras. Photo view 360. That's ray trace rendering. Uh, you do some circuit work, so I don't ever touch that. There's just lots and lots of things in here. Anyway, so I've already loaded in simulation. If you get the simulation tab, once you do it, you can click on study advisor, but that takes you to a wizard which has like a lot of steps. I would just recommend going to new study, static, say okay. And this brings up a tab down here called study one. We're now not in the model tab anymore, we're in study one. Uh, and we have this new list down here. Basically what you do is just go top to bottom and make sure everything's happy. Uh, we start with the pull test material sample. Uh, this is telling you what material this uh, solid is made from. Right now it's aluminum 2024 alloy. We change this to IPS units so we can kind of get an understanding. The tensile strength of this aluminum is basically 27,000 PSI. That's how much force it can take before it absolutely just lets go. Uh, yield strength is only 11,000. So that means that's how much force it can take before it really starts giving way. Uh, you can read that Wikipedia article I'll link, link, link you to to really understand more about that. So right now it's an aluminum test sample we can pull on. Uh, connections are whenever you need to make connections between assembly parts, between bodies. Uh, most of the time, in fact, in everything you're doing this homework, it is, uh, it's already connected. It's not going to be a problem for you. But fixtures, this is where you tell it what's fixed in the face, what's not going to move. Uh, if you had a bridge, you know, the, the ramps are going to be fixed, the pillars going to the ground are fixed. In this case, we click fixed geometry, and I want the top of this sample to be fixed. And then, just like you're doing a pull test machine, on external loads, I'm going to right click and apply a force to the bottom of that sample. Now, right now, the arrows are pushing in, which means compression. I just want to flip them, which is going to make it tension. Instead of uh, newtons, I'm going to apply, what, 200 pounds of force. So I'm going to pull down on that bottom surface with 200 pounds of force. Uh, keep in mind, there is a difference between using a pressure type external load and a force external load. All I have to do now is uh, simply go click run, and it meshes the model, and it solves it, and it displays the stress. Notice that the stress is a maximum right here where it necks down. That's by design. That's the reason they have that hourglass shape to it. They measure that area very specific, very precisely, and uh, so they can know exactly uh, how much pressure is being exerted on that cross section. So when they know when it breaks, they know what to basically divide by. Uh, but this shows the part, the stress di distribution is very, very simple. And that's kind of by design. These have been analyzed numer or, uh, analytically, longhand mathematics, because uh, they're meant to be a very simple test case. Uh, FBA is primarily meant for very complicated shapes. Something like this you could do by hand just fine. But it's a good starting point. What, what I said whenever I said it was meshing, you can go here and say show mesh. And this is what SOLIDWORKS actually did to the part. They divided the entire thing up into hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, depending on the size of your part and the detail of your mesh, and a whole bunch of tiny little elements. And they did the simple stress calculations of each one, added up the entire solution, and gave you the answer you're looking for. So whenever you hear something meshing or it failed to mesh, that's what this means. It failed to divide your part, or it did divide your part, into a bunch of tiny little segments. And finally, you get to show the stress distribution. We have it in Pascal's here, units per meter squared. Let's go ahead and uh, edit that definition and change it to PSI. So we have a maximum stress of 4,156 PSI. The yield strength is 10,998 10, PSI. Is this part okay? Is it going to break at this point? No, it's not going to yield. So we're still underneath that. 
Also notice though that the force where it's originally applied, like the part, has stretched a tremendous amount. Does aluminum really bend that much when you pull on it with only 200 pounds? Now it breaks long before it, it stretched that much. What's happening is that the deformed shape is uh, magnified. It has an automatic magnification of 697 times right now. If we change back to true scale, and say, okay, you see this looks a lot more reasonable for deformation. Uh, they magnify the deformation a lot of times to show you which parts are moving the most because uh, oftentimes structural pieces, especially those that aren't going to break, don't deform extremely. So this is probably a good way to do it. Uh, one of the things pretty neat is you can just click on animate. It shows you how the stress is being applied and taken off the part. So as you stress it up, this is how it's, it's coming in. I think it's pretty neat. You can also save that to a video over all right, so that's enough of the basic parts. Anybody have questions on FBA or what's actually going on? Or pretty self-explanatory, right? Okay, this part here uh, comes pre-configured. This is a wing spar, half of a wing spar. If you can imagine on this, those faces right there, if it was mirrored the other way around, it'd be the spar of a small RC airplane. This was done, this design is taken from or similar to the senior design teams for Speed Fest last year. One of the teams put their battery right through the middle of their wing spar, which is typically a bad idea because then they had to expand it, go around the battery, and come down the other side back into the wing. And these planes are meant to go you know, 200 miles an hour, so having very thin wings is a good thing. They didn't want to just carry the spar all the way up to the very top of the part because then that would add a lot of frontal area, that would add a lot of drag. It would just be kind of weird. So they neck it down like this and introduce a lot of stress concentration. So in fact, I can just show you that. We go steady. I've already got a pressure force applied to the bottom of the wing, uh, 50 pounds force, I guess a total force, 50 pounds force, I've got these ends fixed. Uh, that's a symmetry plane, so you might think like in an airplane, nothing's really fixed, right? It's only just flying around in the sky. But in this case, since it's a symmetry plane around the center of gravity, you can just chop the, chop the airplane in half, fix it in the middle, and then bend the wing up to simulate what happens whenever you get under a high G load. Uh, these airplanes in the corners would pull 40 to 60 Gs, just a tremendous amount, stuff that kills humans. Uh, these little UAVs just right around the corner, it's no problem. So really it's already pre-configured, so we can run it, it meshes it, and then it will solve it. it. Gives us this flag. What this is saying, you can read it in detail, but it basically says that your part is bending a whole, whole lot. This is made of ABS plastic, the real part was. The real part was made of carbon fiber and balsa wood. Uh, but just for simplicity, I used ABS, which is a somewhat, it's a plastic that can deform quite greatly, it has a small Young's modular, yes, modulus of elasticity is probably a better way to say it. Um, it it's quite springy. Um, so what this is telling you is that it's, it's deformed quite a bit, that your situation might require uh, iterative solutions, uh, nonlinear solution methods perhaps if you're getting into the yielded region of the material. So it's asking you, do you want me to go to the more complicated solver which is iterative, or do you want me to just stay with a simple small displacement solver which I can solve directly for the stress you need? Uh, this is basically just like how long you want to take to solve it. There's no guarantee an iterative solver will work. Um, so we'll just say no, stay with small displacement, because we're just doing this as an academic exercise. So you now see this really complicated part that would take you a long time, or a decently long time to do by hand. As long as you have a 3D model of it, you can just apply the load you want and see exactly where the stress concentrations are happening. In this case, is this part going to work? Yes, no. I see some saying yes, some saying no. The what? What's yield strength? Yield strength, good point. Is given no work. Yield strength is 4,351. So I ask, given that the yield is 4,351, it's not going to work, right? Because the max stress is 8785 right there at the stress, stress point. So you see that by expanding this around the body and then necking it back in, the problem ended up not even being this big hole in the middle where they put their battery through. It's just how quick the stress had to be. Uh, bent back into spar caps. It's trying to basically just crush right there on top of the web. In traditional airplane spars, this portion, that piece of material on the inside is called a web. I have flat stuff on top, it's usually made of carbon fiber, and it's called the spar cap. Um, just for better description. So you see how it's deforming quite a bit. Um, all we have to do is now go in and fix this. How do you go about uh, lowering the stress on something without changing the material, without changing anything else? I, you can only change geometry. Since I'm asking you to make it work, I'm going to go the opposite direction, do it myself, and make it worse. So I can go back to the model. Uh, the shell, I'm going to change that from the tenth of an inch. I'll make that thinner. So 
So not only make it worse, less material will make it break easier, right? So I'm going to edit this sketch that makes it up. Let's see here. I'll make this uh, thinner. I will expand the hole in the middle. And that should be nice and terrible. So <laughs> that'll work. Study one. You see now we have these uh, exclamation points next to mesh and results. The part has changed. So it's telling me that those are no longer valid. I can't go down there and view these old results anymore. I guess I might be able to. But actually, it still shows me the old model, which is very, very nice of it. Anyway, I'll just go ahead and run everything again. It remeshes it. It will resolve it. I want to stay with the small displacement solver. There we go. And there we go. You can see it's extremely horrible. So 30,000 PSI. Uh, this is well within the, or well outside of the maximum strength of that material. Should I consider, like, if I put this shape through that load, would it look exactly like this? No, it would have long since failed. This is assuming linear materials. At, at some point, this thing is just going to snap and come apart. Um, so just know that once you go past yield strength, once you go past, or once you go into the nonlinear areas, unless you're using a nonlinear solver, which this has, but you're not probably going to use this homework, uh, it's, the shape is going to be uh, misrepresented. OK, so that's the wing part. You basically go through and fix that following the directions in the homework. Last thing I need to show you. File open. This is kind of a cool part. Get you kind of hopefully excited about your bridge. Uh, sample bridge. Yep. So this is a simple bridge I put together. Uh, as you can see, it uses like six inch by six inch solid pieces of steel. This is not very representative of something you could actually manufacture. This is just a giant, like you know, single piece forged, you know, four hundred foot long bridge. That's not going to happen. Um, just massive pieces of metal. So expect the stresses to be fairly low. Uh, there should be massive room for improvement in uh, the stress distribution of this uh, bridge. Anyway, enough talking. More simulation. Uh, new study. Static. Yep. Okay. So we're now in study one. Uh, we have sample bridge, which interestingly enough has two bodies. I can assign two different materials. And the reason I can do this on this part and couldn't in the other is that I've saved this as two different solid bodies. Remember, I was working on the part. I have one solid body that represents the deck. One solid body that represents the structure. This is how you can assign different materials. On your bridge, your cables will probably be some sort of steel, some sort of you know whatever. And then the deck will probably be wood, or maybe it'll be concrete, whatever you're going to use, steel, um, trampoline. I don't know. Um, so that's how you do it. Make sure they're separate bodies. Remember, we use the merge uh, checkbox in a lot of these tools we're using. That's how you control what gets going together and what doesn't. OK, so it's all body one. I can apply and edit material. This is the walkway. Yep. So I'd like to go down, select a wooden walkway. I would like to use pine, but there's a problem. Uh, Pine's elastic modulus, Poisson's ratio, yield strength, uh, and tensile strength are not populated. Now, why wouldn't SolidWorks include that? I mean, it should be the test, right? There's surely some data out there for pine wood. Why wouldn't they include it in their software? Yeah. The what? There's a lot of answers that I couldn't understand the answer. Variable. Variable. Right, exactly. It changes. Um, you can grab a piece of pine wood with a knot in the middle of it. It's going to break it. You know, half the strength or something that it doesn't have some deformed uh, fiber. That's that's why they don't want to be liable for giving you some sort of number, so you don't make your you know pine wood pressure vessels CO2 you know paintball tank. They get chunks of splitters like all the way through your body. Um, they don't want to be liable for that kind of thing. Similarly, they don't have numbers in here for carbon fiber. Kind of the same reason. Carbon fibers are still not the best understood material. A lot of people try to misuse them. A lot of people don't understand how important under the analysis of their directionality is. So to avoid the entire problem, they don't populate them with uh, material properties. That being said, remember we can make custom materials. If you want to use carbon fiber in your bridge, if you want to use wood in your bridge, feel free to go on the internet. This is just an academic exercise. Find uh, some stats for pine uh, and plug them in as custom material. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Your report say, hey, I got these stats from here, from this website, from Jimmy Jobs, you know, tree page. I don't know. Um, also, a website called Matweb, M-A-T-W-E-B, has a lot of stats for metal, carbon fiber, lots of different types of uh, materials there. So you find what you need on those, in those places. Uh, as a stand-in for the moment, I'm just going to make a walkway aluminum, aluminum, 2014. It's nice and weak. 
Uh, the, the superstructure, I believe, is steel. Uh, AISI 4340 steel, if we change this to real units, we see that's good to 160,900 PSI, which is very, very, very good. All right, so we have this massive single drop forge, you know, huge superstructure that we can never actually possibly manufacture, uh, connected to an aluminum walkway, so this thing should be stout. and also weigh about like 4,000 pounds. Uh, fixtures, only really need to worry about fixed geometry right here. Uh, I want to fix the bottom surface of this walkway, fix the bottom surface of that, and this. It's basically things that I'm going to consider in the model will never move, period. Uh, that guy, this guy, that's great. All right. Notice in fixtures you have a lot of other options. You have roller, slider, uh, fixed hinge, elastic support, bearing. You can get pretty complicated with how you constrain things. That's one of the, that's one of the areas you can really do a lot of training in. Setting boundary conditions, setting fixture properties are really important. Well, part of the, it's just visual. Uh, I actually wanted that too. It's something on this computer. I go home and work on this, it changes back to gray. It's the visual properties which still would. Once you see them, we do the analysis, it all gets treated a little bit. So, I don't know. Uh, actually, maybe, is it because of the surface? Which one? Is it? I don't even know. Nope, don't know. Uh, visual properties do get reset. You could go in, I'm sure, right click on it, and we can change appearances to that body. See, now you got me wanting to fix it all. Yeah, see, I have no clue. Why is it not changing over there? It should. Um, the important thing is it still works. The fixtures, fix one, that looks good. External loads, I'm going to apply what? Do you want a force or a pressure? A force, because the pressure is forcing the area. Exactly. It's kind of the same thing, but which one in our case is easier to apply? Force. A force? We give we give us a metric of 85 pounds per square foot, which is a pressure measurement. We could do it as a force, but then we'd have to calculate. We'd have to you know go and use the measure tool, see how much area we have in the walkway, and apply total force to it. Or if we want to, we just apply pressure. The SolarWorks will do all that math for us. Um, engineering is a large part about being lazy. So <laughs> making machines do things you don't want to. So there we go. Pressure assigned all the spaces, I want to use this in real PSI. Uh, 85 PSF is equivalent to 0 0.59 PSI. Okay, let's go in the right direction, looks good. I also need to apply gravity, because the weight of the material out here in the middle definitely matters on how uh, stress is going to be distributed. So now I have gravity going down, which really enough, you can have gravity pointing sideways if you want. You have, if you have some reason to do a drop test, or I don't know what you want gravity going another direction for, you want to simulate uh, a rail gun. You could put in a gravitational force turn to simulate the EM fields can accelerate your projectile. You could do that. Uh, there you go. External loads, got that. Mesh, is it, is it meshed yet? But let's go ahead and mash the run button and see if this works. Mesh fine, not solving. Perfect. Right. Um, why does it look like this? Gives us what? No, it's, it's actually just fine. The, the highest stress here is uh, 90,000, or this is in Pascal, stupid Pascal, come on. PSI, there we go. Highest stress here is only 13,000 PSI because we made this thing out of like structural solid pieces of steel like that big, uh, or I did. Why does it look like that? Why does it look all messed up? You don't want to put this picture on the front of your report, do you? That guy will, okay. <laughs> Really? If you cover this, why did the material test sample look like it expanded like five inches? It was only really weird. Magnification. Magnified. Magnification, correct. Magnified, so you right click on that, edit definition, take back to true scale deformation, and hey look, we still have a bridge. Um, let me turn off external loads. I'm going to hide all of these. I'm going to hide all of my fixtures so all those annoying arrows go away. Actually, let me look at the stress distribution of this bridge. This is what FBA is useful for. And this is how you can use it as an engineer who's not trained in FEA. Because to actually go in and say, if you want it to be exactly true, I can think, if I right click on this, I can go to probe. I want to go in here and say, ah, well obviously that point has an absolute value of stress of 7,652 PSI because I've done this perfect and I'm the best. No, you can't say that as a you know, first or second year engineer. But if you want to say instead that this beam should be strengthened, this one doesn't matter so much when you take weight out of that, 
Uh, these two beams seem to be very important. If we look at the deformation, or in fact, I can show you a deformation plot. The second plot is displacement. If we look at the displacement of this center uh, walkway portion here. How would that feel when you walk on it compared to the other reefs? Squishy. It would feel like it's kind of moving. It would be a little bit springy. That is the springiest, to use a technical term, uh, portion of the bridge. So you should probably think about that. Um, gaining design insight through a quick FEA run like this is invaluable, especially when you're prototyping. You avoid some of the dumbest things you might just miss uh, through thought. Instead of just designing a part arbitrarily, instead of thinking, ah, quarter inch thickness is probably going to hold this pressure, you can actually test it. If you have an you know, oddly shaped pressure vessel, you can see how it actually is going to deform, how much stretch is actually going to hold, so you pop a portion of it out. You can see, like, this port region up there is very important. Perhaps you uh, increase the thickness there, perhaps you use a different material, you reinforce it with something or the other, I don't know. It just shows you where things are going to have a problem. Uh, the walkway is completely fine here. Why is that? a giant chunk of solid aluminum. Uh, we should probably go and find some wood properties, simulate that with some actual wood. Um, this is a very simplistic bridge, overly simplistic. Uh, hopefully with as, as much detail as you're going to put into your bridge models for the reports, uh, I would be very impressed if you could get the entire bridge to solve with everything in it. Like if you have 100 or 150 different parts in your bridge, I'd be pretty surprised if all of that was solved through FDA. I'm not saying it's not possible, because it certainly is. But it can be cantankerous. That's why if you read the description of what I want as far as FDA goes in the project, I want a demonstration that you can do FDA. The part doesn't actually have to you know, work mechanically. It, it can fail, and you have still proven that you can do FDA on these parts. So if you have questions on what I'm actually looking for as far as FDA goes, you're free, feel free to email me. But hopefully you find this stuff kind of fun, because this is a, an extremely, extremely complicated calculation. You've all taken statics, right? You're in it right now. You know that sometimes those simple bridge problems can take you a handful of minutes. And that's just looking at pure tension and compression forces. Once you actually go into beam design, that can take you a little bit longer, especially complicated stuff like this. Once you actually go into structural analysis, using multiple beams, transferring stress loads, even in simplified cases, if you model this bridge accurately through that, it would take you a day or two. But to do full FEA, where you actually even go to a higher level of mathematics than anything you could ever do by hand, uh, and just to do it with one little click in, what, 20 seconds? It, it's an amazing capability that you're really kind of the first generation of engineers to have this. This is the first uh, SOLIDWORKS class that's ever learned FDA at OSU. Um, so you, the what? So we were playing the first one. Yeah, first. <laughs> first. Yeah. first. Um, in fact, is Tim here today? I don't think he made it, but it's Tim. And a few seniors who wanted to come and sit on it and learn how to do FDA, but obviously they weren't serious. <laughs> anyway, so I think it's a very cool capability. You press the FDA button, it tells you what's going to break or what's under, under stress. I want to make sure I cover the important stuff. Fixed load, solid forces, load mass. Okay. The last display down here is strain. You can show strain. And how. For somebody who's familiar with materials, or we had one guy in material science, how is strain different than displacement? You've got the displacement over here on the shoulder. Correct. It is a percentage change. So this is dealing with like kind of the local change in that little cube of steel's length. So how much is each individual location being compressed? How much is, you know, like, obviously these beams up here, they're under large compressive load. They're under quite a bit of strain. Um, other areas aren't being strained at all. This deformation just kind of really throws me for a loop. Kind of okay, so we'll go back to stress. Um, anything else in these? Anything else? Anybody have questions or something you think you should be able to see here? You can do also, you know, isosurface clipping, section clipping. You can cut this thing in half and see what the stress is doing inside of the part. Because it's actually 3D stress distribution. Uh, it calculates the inside of the steel just as much as it does the surface. Um, You can change the minimum max of the plot over here as well as the units. You can change the type of stress that you're displaying. Von Mises is a common display unit, but certainly not the only thing that stress engineers would look at. Understanding that is also another advanced topic you should know before you really uh, say that the part's going to work or not going to work. Uh, any questions at all on this? No? Okay. 
I will uh, meet you guys up in the lab. Close your dismiss. Just be sure to uh, be sure to remember that if those bolts don't copy properly, you can always just drag and drop from other locations. So your smart components, smart factory. You guys up there.